Alhamdulillah, nice to see you, to see you nice. If you come from wherever you are, I came from where you were. What are you with me? Uh, today we are talking about humanitarian work. Humanitarian work is a philosophy of thinking. It's an industry. It's a product. It's a community building. It's character building, leadership building problem solving, and you can say whatever you want to say. It is one of the most powerful soft powers, like media, like arts, like literacy or liter literatures, like drama. Humanitarian work can go to anywhere. Politicians cannot reach. Economics, economists cannot reach, and military cannot reach, and government cannot reach. Humanitarian work is the first responder to anything and the first discoverer in the field of what the people suffering, of the people suffering. You can see it before it becomes a fire, before the smoke comes out, because you are on the grassroots level mixing with every and anybody. If you want to do the humanitarian work, you have to have certain criteria, value, value for yourself, for your community, for the society, and for the work itself. If you come to me having no values, but you are professional, I tell you, don't need you. If you come to me having a lot of money and have no value, I don't need you. Your money is nothing for me. I don't work with people who have no value. This is number one. If you want to become a humanitarian worker or social worker, you have to have a message to deliver to the community in your action, in your behavior, in your attitude, and in your product. Your product has to deliver a message to the people. It's number two. If you want to work in humanitarian work, you have to have a vision, not for yourself, but for my community, for the marginalized in Somalia, in Kenya, in Bosnia, in Syria, in Yemen, in Egypt, wherever you want. North Africa, East Africa, South Africa, whatever you call it. You cannot work without having a vision. We have to revisit our attitude to rebuild our character and shape it before, during, and after becoming a material worker. Humanitarian work is a process of change of the mind of the people who work for humanity. You keep changing yourself according to the needs of the community. Because you are a problem solver. You are not somebody coming to me for a salary, out. For a photograph, out. For a position, out. You know why? Because you are dealing with the feeling of the people. You are dealing with the hopes of the people. You are dealing with the dreams of the children. You are dealing with the aspiration. This flower, where it came from? Ah. <laughs> Bosnia. Hope and peace. Srebrenica. Do you feel the agony of Srebrenica? If you don't, I want you. I will not work with you. Unless you feel it. Because this Bosnian woman and this Bosnian child or this Chadian or Central African child is paying your salary as a humanitarian worker. Don't come and tell me my government is paying my salary. No way. Your government will not pay your salary unless you work for those people. Unless you have the value for those people. Unless you have the mission and the vision and the message for those people. Unless those people will be happy with you. You can tell me one day, I don't want to go to Somalia because it's risky for your life. How about the people who are living in Somalia? And we claim that we are supporting them. We are standing for them, but from our office in Doha, in Dubai, in Cairo, in Riyadh, in London, in Paris, in Rome, Fankush. All these are Fankush for me. Nothing. If you want to stand for the people of Somalia, you go to Makdishu. 
You go to Magdishu, and our life will never be taken out unless it's going to be taken out wherever I am and in London or Doha or Somalia or anywhere else. This is the message and the meaning of how we become a humanitarian worker. What is lacking in a humanitarian field is the manner. We talk about 16 or 17 SDV, SA? Huh? SDGs. SDGs. MDGs. And maybe in 20 years it will be BBZs. We can go this. ZDGs. Whatever you call it. The manner. We're talking about the rights of refugees. I have no right to talk top down to any miserably looking child or a woman or an adult in a camp, in a community center, in a hospital, in a clinic. I have no right whatsoever to do that because they have the right to empower me for heaven. This is the difference between me and the young boy. Treat your team or orphan badly. He is like the one who denied the day of judgment. Fadda ya rais. طلت علينا طلة جميلة. ولا يحض على طعام مسكين. Do you know a word called advocacy? Are we good in advocacy? Do you know how to deal and how to advocate for others? If Allah mentioned this in the Holy Quran 1400 years ago, يحض 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 to announce the needs, to talk about the needs. To drive the needs and to meet the needs. This is advocacy. Now they teach us, they teach us, they teach us advocacy. Where? Put it silent. They teach us advocacy, where advocacy has been given to us 1400 years ago. This is humanitarian work. It's not an easy going platform, it's a time consuming, could be back breaking. Headache and neck ache because we claim that we are the saviors of the needy people. We have to stand up for what we talk about. We have to stand up for the rights for the people. And this is that. This is number one about the manner and the etiquette. Humanitarian work is not a code of dress, it's not a logo, it's not an emblem, it's not a name of organization. It's nothing. This is ego. And if the ego will be growing, it will kill me and my community. Fasad and nafs yati min hub nafs. The self-destruction of the soul comes from the, the ultimate love of the individual to himself or herself. The ego. I am. I am. So what? If a mosquito hits me or suck my blood, I'll be bedridden for a month or two or a year or two. If small blood clot come to stop the blood flow in my heart, I'll be dead. I am. I am nothing. That's how when we serve people, we have to put ourselves in their shoes. And I mean it in their shoes, and I mean it, in their shoes. And if you want to argue with me, see me around. Seriously, it's a challenge. Don't come and give me a lecture. Come and give me a product that can help, serve, and let me to see yourself bowing down for the community. Bow, 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 bow. Yes, sir. And Mr. Sir or her ladyship is the orphan, is the widow, is the displaced, is the raped. Do you know, sisters, that the highest rate of rape 
of girls and women in DRC, Democratic Republic of, Co of, of Congo, and once a woman raped, continuously raped. Do you know that our sisters from Syria selling uh, themselves because they have no means, and some people, bad people like myself, go there to have fun and fool the young girls for a temporary marriage, false marriage for three to six months. You have to stand for this. You have to stand for this and find the solution to stop those ugly faces who come to abuse the refugees. In my own opinion, before I open the floor for discussion, what do you call it? Forcing or compelling the people to change their culture, to change their religion, and to change their morality is a crime against humanity. This is in my own opinion. And if you want to discuss it with me, I can see you around. <laughs> Professor Asalam never compel anybody to become a Muslim. لا إكراف الدين. If you're going to compel people to become Muslim, no way. You talk to their mind. To make the logic. Show them your behavior, your moral values, and let them to think about themselves. But come and compelling them, it's not on my table. It's not on my agenda. It was not on the agenda of the Prophet Humanitarian work, work and morality and values come from my religion. I'm very proud of it. Absolutely proud of being a Muslim and to hope to see the whole world a Muslim. But I'm not going to compel anyone to force anyone to follow me, to follow my culture, or to follow my religion. If I'm good, they will follow me. If I'm bad, they will never follow me. Clear? Now I'll open the floor for discussion, and I want a hot, uh, sometimes stupid question, sometimes logic question. I can take anything. Okay? Yes? Go on. Fred? Yes, sir? Yes? Arabic, English, Urdu, whatever you want. <laughs> Come on, who can start first? Okay, I can start. Ta'ali Gambi. No, 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 no. You have to be a leader. I said you might make you a leader. Come, 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 come. Let people to be very proud of you. Talk to the audience. No, 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 no. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Come next to me. I'd be very proud to stand to the future next to the future. Talk to the people. Okay. No, 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 no. Bismillah. Okay, bismillah. Ah. <laughs> okay, so I'd like to ask you, what are the main challenges that, that face today the humanitarian work? And do you think everyone should go to humanitarian work? And what's wrong with people that are working here, Yani? Mm. Now, when, you, when you start the speech, you're directing everyone to go to humanitarian work. Yes. Do you think the real solution is doing the humanitarian work? Or like maybe some people would just sit here and try to solve the core issue? And, uh, j and answer the question about the challenges. <laughs> Inshallah. Challenges? So I'm not asking every and each one of you to become a humanitarian worker. But I'm talking about humanitarian work as a value. That we became, as Muslims and Arabs, backward. We are not doing much. In spite of the fact we have got a lot of problems. 60-70% of the refugees in this place are from the Muslim and Arab countries. That's why I'm encouraging young people like yourself to shift. But it's not the solution for all the problems. There's social work. There's economical work, there's political work, there's everything. It's research, advocacy, everything. So I'm very proud to be here. There's theological work, all this. We need it all. But because the absent factor in our community is how to deal with the rising or the rising number of problems affecting our communities and our societies and our ummah. Whether it's conflict, war conflict, or was this climate change and others? That's why I'm trying to shift your thinking. Problems facing humanitarian work, first of all, I don't want to work for humanitarian organization. Why? Because there's no future. The human resources. If I'm in, a rich, in, in, in an Arab rich country, oil producing country, I will never think to go to humanitarian work because the salary is, is not comparable. It's number one, economy. Economy for life and of life. It's number one. Number two, everybody thinks that the humanitarian work is just anybody can do it. 
they don't understand that humanitarian work is a science, is a subject, is actually an art, and is a profession. Like medicine, like engineering, like agriculture, like politics, like, 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 like. People think that humanitarian work is just food pack, food boxes, or Ramadan boxes, kurba, or adahi, or kaza, or kaza. No, that's not. This is, this is emotional response to a problem, but not humanitarian work. So I talk about human resources. The second problem is the war on terror, counter-extremism, counter-radicalism, and counter-terrorism. It's hindering most of the Muslim-led charity organization in the MTM field. Banking, stopping the transfer, and the fear that the Muslims See, the Muslims have been accused of being terrorists till they prove otherwise. My name is El Banna. And you know what El Banna means. I have to be stopped in certain airports, sometimes be very well entertained in a small cubicle room for a day or two because my name. What is this? You understand? That's actually the perception. Okay? And the counter-extremism, the counter-radicalism, the counter-extremism. This is number, number two. The banking, number three. The money transfer, number four. The fear of the donors. Now they frighten the donor to donate money to Muslim charities, particularly. No, 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 no. I don't want to give it to, to you. I give it, I rather give it to United Nations. I'm not against United Nations, but I'm telling you, I want to build my local community and make them to be humanitarian leaders. By keep giving the United Nations, I will never be able to do it. No water, no matter. And they can meet me around. No way. I have to change my policy to build you as Qatari, to build you as Italian, to build you as Egyptian, to build you to be able to deliver. What? Giving all my money to one organization to release the responsibility from me, it is a failure on the intellectual capability of the individual who passes the money to the United Nations and not empowering their own people. And you can see me about it, because I'm very, very strong about that. I will have to build future generation to become the future leader of my own country. See, who is going to raise my flag? It's you. Is that right? Al-Annabi, Mila Hayrfa'a, Anta. You. You got it? But you have to be qualified to be standing on the international arena, on the global arena, and people listen to you. It's not to support just an event, it is to make the event. It's not just to make the event, it is to make the event which can make the change. It's not only to make the event which makes the change, but the change which is positive and driving the community and building community and building peace. And by investing in you. It's another challenge. Inability, our inability to see that investment in my human resources are more important than, um, are more important than passing the money to another organization. Any more challenges? No. Governance no. of, huh? sorry? You said that uh, it's not easy to become a humanitarian worker. I wanted to ask what are the skills uh, that we, that in your opinion, are important to become What are the skills for me and you to become a humanitarian worker? First of all, your sincerity, your commitment, and your values, and your mission, and your vision for the sector. Next to that, you have to build your professionalism. It's not a box of food. It's not a box of food. Most of our money is going for food boxes. What is this? It's passed, halas, finished. It is building community, empowering community, preventing extremism and terrorism. That's why having the knowledge, humanitarian work, sister, what's the higher? Nura, Sister Nura, humanitarian work is become like an art and the subject and speciality and degree. It's not something like, oh, well, he, he does not have a job. Ask him to come and work for our organization. Don't allow it to happen in Qatar, huh? Yes? Of course, thank you. Don't accept anybody. You have to get the people who knows what they can. Will he be able? I'll ask you the question. Uh, your wife is pregnant. Will you take her to a gynecologist or to an engineer? Which one? Gynecologist. 
Huh? Not engineer. Of course. Will you go to a plumber to have your baby out or your engineer? Or to a gynecologist? That's it. You have this, this kind of speciality. Humanitarian work is a specialism. Okay, this number. So education, being professional, having the values, and, under, and having the drive. Love what you do to do what you love. It's not my, my proverb, but somebody else's proverb. Love what you do. حبوا ما تعملون تعملوا ما تحبون. In Turkish, love what you do to do what you love. <laughs> and there's more. More. You see, but the most importantly, I was say about the moral values and the drive and the love. I have a, a friend of mine from Pakistan who bought the three moral values are عشق, علم, and عمل. عشق, that you love the work that you are doing. علم, that you build your knowledge. عمل, you apply the knowledge in what you love. First, you have to love it. Second, you have to learn. Third, you have to act. Yes, sister? Uh, Noura. Noura. Very good. Fadal, تعال هنا. Ibn Surya. Ibn Surya al Galia. أنت من الكلانية ولا منين؟ أنا أم كلانية. وأنا كلاني برضه. So my question is the amount of funding is increasing year by year for the humanitarian field. Although the amount of crisis and uh, problems are also getting okay. bigger. So how do you think it's, yani, is there like uh, corruption in the, in the humanitarian organization? Because they're getting funding, but still the problems are getting bigger and bigger. So if you could highlight. So it's uh, a, a tough no. question. No, no, don't worry. We can boil it because like the camel meat, huh? <laughs> you see, humanitarian organizations are not responsible for the problems. Who created the war in Syria? It's not Oxfam, it's not Save the Children, it's not Qatar Charity, it's not Islamic Relief. Who is throwing the people from Uyghur in China? It's not me. Who is creating the problem for Rohingya. It's not me. Nearly seven, uh, 700,000 or 800,000 refugees now. Even their status in Bangladesh is not displaced, neither displaced, nor the refugees. Because if they are refugees, they will deal differently with the uh, Bengali government. If they are displaced, they have to be inside their own country. Okay? Who is creating the problem in Yemen? It's not a humanitarian organization. Okay, all these conflicts in, 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 in South Sudan, in Libya, and in, in, in Gaza, in Palestine, it's not the humanitarian organization. I disagree. Huh? I disagree. Okay, I, I, I'll, I'll ask you to do that. But it's not the humanitarian organization. What I'm saying, it's not the humanitarian organization who are creating it. Okay? It could be anyone, anybody. What the humanitarian organization are doing are responding are responding. So you are, as a Qatar charity, going to Gaza to help. Is that right? But you're not the one who's creating the conflict. Okay? You're not the one who's creating the conflict in Yemen or in Iraq or whatever. It's not you. With your question, why the, the, the amount of money is increasing because the government, some of the government would like to clean the mess they have done. So they give more money to humanitarian organization. This is the the connotation of the political background of it. Who is, there's a conflict in Somalia. You know that in Somalia, still in certain areas they can do a lot of development work, but there's no funding from the big donors. It's only the funding restricted to humanitarian response. There's political background behind funding. When I become your age, okay, and grew up, we will understand that any funding is coming from X, Y, or Z has a political connection. Is our donation will enable the community to be empowered, to stop the war, to build the community? Here we can ask ourselves all these questions. So there is an increase of donation because the conflict and who are, who created the conflict. We have to talk about the root causes. 
Yes, sister, you disagree with me? Come, please. Please, because I would love to be next to you. I would love to rise and to be elevated to stand next to you. Tell them why you disagree with me. So, I disagree with you on this point because... Alhamdulillah, no problem. Yeah, because there are many uh, international organizations that work in the field. They are actually creating, not causing the war or the conflict, but they are contributing by, uh, for ah. example, focusing on one, of, one group rather than the other. For example, Muslim charities, sometimes they say, our donation will go only for Sunni Muslims, for example, or only for Muslims, but we are not going to help the Christians and the Jews, for example, even though that they are in need. So they are not maybe contributing to the main... It can ex escalate and yes. create more problems. So that's why I disagree on that point that, yes, maybe they don't contribute to the main conflict, and they are some of them, for example... Contributing. But they are contributing, they are part of the community because they are already there, and they are already engaging with beneficiaries. So, yes, they, I, I so, so. So, so I agree with you, in spite of the fact you disagree with me, but I agree with you. Because his question was actually, he's saying a lot of money coming for the root causes. Our contribution on cultural background, on religious background, is a contributing factor to the main problem. So there's a problem allowed me to work there. Some of the principles of the humanitarian principles, which is the ICRC created with the United Nations, is neutrality and impartiality. That quite, I agree totally with you. I'm not disagreeing with you at all on breaking the rule of impartiality and neutrality. Sometimes focusing only on women, focusing only on certain areas. But for me, as a Muslim, I should be guided by the neutrality and the impartiality of what Allah said. al miskin, al yatim. Al-Armala, without putting any religious background behind it. So really, you are right okay, as a contributing factor. His question was about the main problem, actually. Yani, you want to have another question? Yeah, I just want to ask you. Because the camera has to you. Let's go, guys. My question is that then we come to Islamic Relief. Ah. And then in, in your implementation, do you focus on Muslims or in like Muslim slash Sunni or you don't differentiate between sex for example and religion. Okay. So I just want to know now since you are the leading in Islamic relief, I would like to know more about the practice in Islamic relief and especially like engaging in Syria uh, Syrian war and other wars in the uh, MENA region and even non MENA region and in the most IOC countries. So so I wanna know how okay. Islamic relief basically operates. Okay. In 1992, in Bosnia War, I have a project which involves uh, Bosnian and Croat. Bosnia was about 20 to 30 percent of the people, the, the people benefiting from the distribution of goats and, uh, and seeds actually were not Muslim. This is number one. And during Chechnya War, we, they were never, we never, we never uh, uh, discriminate against the Russian who were living in Chechnya. Anybody here from Russia? No? See? Even a Russian woman, I remember this story, came, we were, we were, we were actually giving the luncheon, changing Qurbani into luncheon. And she said, I am not a Muslim. Uh, am I allowed? Said, of course. This, this Qurbani is not only for Muslims, it's for anybody. It's number one. Number two. Number three, when we start to work in South Sudan, we did not work to, to proselytize the Muslims or to convert the non-Muslims to become Muslims. But we're working in a, an area which is called Warab, actually in a, a place called Wow, on water. And the funding came here from Doha, and the water drilling, water drilling machine to drill uh, 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 deep wells in this area. And with the funding came here in 2003 to this area, we managed to solve the problem, 30% of the problem of the people in this area. This number three. In China 2002, I'm giving you facts. In China 2002, actually the earthquake in Xi'an. Okay? It was a Buddhist area. Okay? And there was a partnership between the organization and the local community, which is Buddhist area. They built about two, or three hundred, uh, uh, two or three hundred uh, houses for the people who have been affected by that. If you want to go on and on and on, we can go in, in a very long... 
Because from the very beginning, even the first response to Iran earthquake in 1990, before any Shia or Hunasainiya uh, in, 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 in UK was Islamic Relief. And I was there. And they were making partnership with Iranian Red Crescent. So we never looked at the, the, the theological differences. We never looked at the religious background. And we never looked at the cultural background. So this was how we look. And actually, to be very honest, when the earthquake in Haiti, earthquake it was in Haiti, 2008, huh? Haiti, Haiti, Haiti. You know, the success story of, of, of the UK-based charities, mostly faith-based charities there, more than 22 organizations were raising funds to respond to Haiti earthquake. It's not only Islamic Relief. This is a success story which I want you to have. In the 1990, he said, oh, will you, will you raise funds for the Shia? I said, of course. It's an earthquake. 18 years later on, 22 organizations were raising funds for people who have no religion in Haiti. And this is the success story of the impartiality and neutrality of some of our organizations of our, of our organization in this area. We we'll try as much as we can to go back to Syria issue because of the political there. Our message to the people in, in, uh, in, uh, in Lebanon, in Turkey, and in... Uh, and Jordan, don't, don't give the aid only to your people who are struggling with some of the local Syrian organization to do that. And they are trying to do that at their best. Because if you want to put the Syrian for a trial, you know, the humanitarian work or the, the, the social work of the Syrian as an organization is, is age about six years or five years. It's not like even Qatar. Long time ago, maybe 20, Lagnet Qatar al Kafir al Yatim, it was in the 70s or 80s before it became Qatar charity now. So you took about 30, 40 years. So you have an institutional memory to capitalize from the time of Sheikh Dabbaq to the time of uh, Yusuf al Kawali now and the others. And there's these 35 years or 40 years there. In Turkey, plenty of organization. In Jordan, plenty of organization. But if we bring the young, growing Syrian organization in Turkey, or in, uh, in Jordan or in Lebanon, it is hard and harsh to criminalize them because of this kind of differences they are actually applying sometimes. But we have to, but we have, let me convince them, but we have to tell them this is wrong. You want to put another point before your sister put another point? No, I just wanted to say, like, what is Islamic then in Islamic relief? What's Islamic and Islamic relief in the humanitarian values? It's universal values. ICRC, humanitarian principles, is, n is not far from, from Islam. That's why I accept it. If you tell me in governance, good governance, impartiality, neutrality, fairness, all these kind of things, it's in Islam. Do you want to add anything to it on top of it? You can. You can, but you know, what's your name, sister? Aisha. Aisha. Sure, sister Aisha, you can add when you have the experience the ability, the knowledge, and the drive. And the West will listen to you because they are logic. I tell you something when I was talking about my study, I, was, I failed, I always fail. I failed my doctor of medicine badly. And in spite of the fact I was writing three uh, pages of Quran about creation of man at the gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they gave me a chance again to rewrite the thesis. They never talked about the Quran because the value of the material that I was discussing was above all the differences. And the professor, when he was actually giving me a chance to resubmit my thesis again, said, what is this Quran? I said, it's a scientific knowledge. Al-ma'al-maheen al-nutfa al-alaqa al-mudga kaza 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 sah? He said, yes. I said, okay, do you want it? He said, no, 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 keep it, science. Once you become a professional not all, and learned of the knowledge, then having your own values and the culture, you can put it on the table and discuss it and reasoning it with them. We thank them because they started before us. Now I want you, Sister Aisha and Sister Noor, and what's your name? Nagla. Nagla? 
طب تعالي جنبي انا كم كم <تصفيق> اوكي يو نيد تو اد يور كالتشر اند يور فاليو تو ذا هيمانتيريال فاليوز يس اتفضلي ما فيش رجاله قال ايه منز thank you for coming first of all I have a question personally to you. What urged you to go into humanitarian field from the beginning? And also what urged you to create a separate organization? What was the gap that was not fulfilled by already existing ones when you started? Okay. Uh, I was, uh, uh, how old? And you are, you are young, you are young. And never ask a young girl about her age. <laughs> they're, only, they're only 18, between 18 to 25. But you're still 18. <laughs> uh, I was... I, uh, after, after the, there are two stories. First of all, I wanted, when I become a doctor uh, uh, in UK, after passing my license degree uh, exam, I wanted to, uh, to, 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 uh, uh, to spend my holiday in a, in a Muslim uh, community in Europe. On the way back, I discovered Bosnia. Who's from Bosnia? Nobody from Bosnia here? Yeah, you in Bosnia. On the way back, I discovered Sarajevo. And it was the first uh, mind-blowing for me of seeing the atrocity of the Muslims in Yugoslavia at that time. After that, Sabra and Shatila came in September 1982 to Sarajevo in about June, July, August, and Sabra and Shatila in September 1982. Remember Sabra and Shatila? Anybody remember it? it was, huh? No, no, I remember it. Um, oh, oh, the professor. Can I come and kiss your head? I can't just... Uh, <laughs> I have to stop the talk to come and uh, kiss your head. He's my, he's my ustaz. Yes, of course. How are you, Dr. Alhamdulillah. No, no, no. Alhamdulillah. It's very, very honored to be yeah, with, to with you, you. With you, to be with wow. you. Me and too. I'm very embarrassed to talk while you are sitting. Now I'm going to listen always <laughs> to you, always. <laughs> <laughs> professor Hugo Slim is, uh, is, uh, is one of my teachers. Thank you, thank you. What I was talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, it's Sabra Shatila and uh, and uh, and what do you call it? Uh, uh, and the, the the Bosnian, the the, when the, when the communists and the others were tor torturing the people, the community there. In, in it just put the, the the imprint at the back of my mind. So when the big famine in Africa, if you remember Bob Geldof, Sir Bob Geldof and others. We found that there is no Muslim organization in the whole of Europe standing up for those needy. And they started to, after my visit to Sudan, to collect some photographs, to raise some funds from my family in Egypt, about 1,500 pounds, Egyptian pounds, and, and they came back. And they were going from door to door, mosque to mosque, street to street, shop to shop, with a plastic carrier bag, shopping bag, to, uh, uh, to raise the fund. Five pounds, 10 pounds, 20 pounds. This is how the beginning. How the start was, we did not have any office, any board, any budget, any funding, any vision, any strategy. But we have the drive, as I told you. We want to help the people in Africa. Okay, and this is how we started. And this, the, 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 the snowball started come growing, 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 till it became uh, Islamic leaf. Why did they leave Islamic leaf? Uh, 11 years ago. That's the second part of the question, isn't it? Because we wanted to do something else. We did not find that there's some organization can bring Muslim charities together on one platform. We used to cut the throat of one another. Ah! Compete in the same mosque. Ah! This ego. The love of the logo. Which is a deadly ego. This number one. For the second organization called the Humanitarian Forum. Want to bring Muslims and Muslims together. And we succeeded. It took us 15 years. If you want to build that organization, it's not six months. It's not a few weeks. It's not a big donation from a donor, from a millionaire. It is a, it, it is a, it is a what do you call it, uh, a process of building a system to make the change. It's a process to change the mindset of the young people. Because it's very easy to change the mindset of you at your age. Difficult to come to somebody at my age. And that's why most of the volunteers in the 80s were under 20. 17, 18, 19, 20. And they were really the real power behind creating this humanitarian movement from the Islamic background in Europe from Birmingham, UK. 
So you can make it. Will you be able to do that? Focus. Are you sure? Of course. Ah, anybody else? I'm ready for a fight. <laughs> yes, come on, sir. Tell them who are you. My name is Ahmed. Ahmed. Uh, you were talking about the values, sir. But, I mean, when you said uh, we have to work on the field to be in humanitarian actions, but I've been working here with Rota on uh, on my channel. You know, we've been empowering a lot. Micha. Of yeah, Micha. Coming, coming up from the old uh, Amina region and the change that we saw in the youth that came here and then gone and built their own uh, projects back home. Uh, that gave me, you know, I, I saw the value on that kind of project. So I don't really think that we have to be on the field to, to see all that. When, when I know, when we go there, you will change the whole uh, mindset that you, you've been in. But I think these kind of projects and values is still working. Yes, it is a combination. Somebody like me, I never been posted to become a field worker. But I always visit the field. I always learn from the people in the field. I always uh, feel the dreams of the children in the field. For you at your age, brother Hamada, I give you a nickname, okay? <laughs> Till he finds a wife to give you another nickname. <laughs> uh, being with the people is different from seeing the people, from reading about the people. People drive your heart. Make your vision very clear. Make your spirit to fly higher than the heavens in the sky. Make children to make you the champion of their dream. And the widows to make you the one who can draw the smile on the faces and the heart of their children. The price of being with the people is incredible. Is incredible. We cannot feel it unless we be with the people. Unless we be with the people, unless we live with the people. I can see a lot of Western, European and American women, old women and family living in the middle of the jungles of Africa. Are they crazy? And this is morality in the heart of this 60 or 70 years old woman and her husband who left Norway or left Denmark or left UK or left America and she's living with the people. Being with the people is a self-satisfaction. You know when you put your hand on your heart and say, oh, alhamdulillah, it is there. Being the people, you discover the jewels for humanity and for you to be decorated by such jewels. I want you to be decorated by the people, not by the queen or the king. The queen and the king will never decorate you unless the people say he is our champion. That's why we talk about Sir Bob Geldof in 1983. He became Sir. And many uh, what's her name? Uh, Angelina Jolie. See how her health is not very good, but she's still having the drive. Still having the drive. Uh, what's his name? Uh, 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 a computer. Uh, Bill Gates. Muhammad Yunus. And others. This is the people of the people. And I want you, Muhammad, be one of the people of the people to help the people, to save the people, to drive the people, and to lead the people. I love you. <laughs> yes, sister. Come on, uh, is it Italy or Bosnia or, what, or Turkey? You are the three cultures together. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my question is that when I went to Bosnia, I was 19 years old. And You're still 19. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And it was 19 or 20 years later, the war. Mm. And it really affected me deeply to seeing bullet marks on the buildings and people's psychology. How do you keep your psychological strength? Me? Are you seeing yeah, these crimes, people? I mean, how do you keep that? I, I really want to listen to your speech about it. Thank you. Uh, Alhamdulillah, this is very difficult. 
الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله كيف ترافلين هاف ا ميشن فور يور سيلف ناو ات ماي ايج ويتش ار ستيل 26 ناو از ات رايت ام 26 يو ار 27 ها اند ام تشينجينج ماي فلسفي اوف ثينكينج فروم بينج اوبريشنال اكزيكتيف تو بي تشير اوف بوردز تو ليف ذا بوردز اند تو بي ترافلر ذا مور يو ترافل واتس يور نيم سيستر يولجا The more you travel, the more you be empowered. You be empowered. You know how what do you mean be empowered? It's not a lecture. It's not a book. It is a smile. It is the love of the people to you, which keeps you igniting. This is a discussion with me between me and my wife. She tell me at your age, stop traveling. But I tell her at my age, I'll keep traveling. Okay. You know why? Because. You teach me. If you go to the field, bowing yourself down to the community, listening, talking, passing your knowledge, smiling, even if you don't have, if you have, even if you have empty hands, people don't want from you food or drink. They want to feel the feeling, your feelings, your love towards them. This is what keeps me going, and this is what will keep you going for the, for the coming hundred years, inshallah. People at the age of 80 and 90 are still working hard. That's why I, I, I give the examples of the women and the men from Europe and America who left, left America, left Europe, left everything, and they're still living with the mosquito, with the worms, with all these illnesses in Africa for a mission they have. For a vision they have, for a belief they have. And you have to have this mission, vision, belief, and message in your heart. Once you put it there, you will keep going forever. Inshallah. Akhalas? It's entirely up to you. I'm, I'm here to, to be told stop. Uh, yeah, we have more questions. Any more questions? Huh? Do you have more questions? No, I said ask questions so he doesn't leave. <laughs> you want to stay, Doctor? No, no, I have no problem. He wants to pay Maghrib now. <laughs> no, 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 up to you. So if you have more questions now. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think, uh, let me into. Uh, you want to say something? Uh, they will, uh, for Doctor Islam, they will no. have a lecture. Yeah, huh? huh? They want to have a group picture. Oh, group picture. Okay, but before the group picture, I have to, uh, Professor, can I introduce you? Because I cannot just be there selfish on the stage and my teacher is sitting. No, no, you are my teacher, whether you like it or not. It, I force you to become yeah, my teacher. Okay. okay. Well, uh, Professor Hugo Slim is a teacher of humanity for humanity. I love her, him very much because I learned from him. I used to go to his university, his college to talk while he's actually mentoring me in a very positive way. So this... <laughs> <laughs> it's not entirely true, <laughs> because this is my teacher. No, no. So he used to come and teach when I was in Oxford, and we'd always invite him down, and um, everybody learned a lot from you, Dr. Hanny. No, no, no. So no, no, thank no, you. No, it's no. lovely to see you on such yeah. good form. <laughs> yeah. Good. Let me guess your hand of, ahead in front okay. of everybody. <laughs> thank you. You know, I should kiss you. No, no, no. When you have a teacher, when you have a teacher, you have to respect, honor, and give the credibility to him. From kissing the head to kissing the hand. Well, then I must kiss your hand <laughs> and your head. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Well, sir. Okay. Is it me next, or are we? No, you still, no. you have to wait. Okay, so <laughs> good. Henny, keep going. Yeah, thank you. No, no, I'll finish. I'll start. You and one hour, doctor. Listen, you have to talk to the doctor. What, you have to talk to the doctor? No, no. I still have to talk to the doctor. You want to have a good photo now? 